<coughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, extension reading in Korea, 10 years, going from strength to strength. So we're going to do a little bit, just a little bit about where we've come from and quite a bit about where we're going to. And as I was making the presentation, um, it was dawning on me that we need to make sure that um, as we move forward with promoting extensive reading here in Korea, that we have a clear idea of what we're doing. And I think there's quite a lot of misconceptions that I've noticed talking to some Korean people, reading some things um, about ER. Um, and as we know, it's not yet part of many curriculums, and we need to be clear as we move forward that we have a clear idea of what we're doing. So let's start at the start. So recent history, um, you're familiar with this. Um, extensive reading is not usually practiced in, in Korean uh, EFL. It uh, isn't something that's part of the curriculum uh, in many cases. Um, there's a strong adherence to the Confucian role of the teacher, you know, sit and listen uh, kind of role. Um, students are taught to overanalyze, particularly overanalyze texts, and read only a few lines a lesson. Um, although the Korean textbooks are double the size of a typical Japanese high school textbook, there's still relatively little vocabulary in there um, that are, is repeated enough to make sure that the students will be learning the vocabulary. Um, and there's still an analysis, uh, sort of. Uh, over-analysis of text and a focus on the discrete points of language rather than the systems um, and the processes of learning a language. So the intensive difficult text, usually as you know, for exam preparation, and you guys all know this. In the last few years, we've started to see a few isolated schools, mostly small scale. Some university ones have a program, one or two programs. Rocky's program, for example, has been going a while. But there are relatively few programs here um, on extensive reading. A lot of them tend to focus on kids um, and they started um, quite a few years back. But these are starting to grow. We're starting to see a few more uh, hug ones and so on. We're also starting to see a few more opinion articles coming out almost weekly from my looking on the web and talking to people. People are starting to get the idea of extensive reading and why it's good and what do we do. A lot of these opinion articles are starting to come out and we're starting to get an increase in research in ER in Korea, which I'll talk about soon. There's also a Korean Association of um, English Reading Education, which is started uh, by Dr. Shin, I think, in two, uh, 2008. And so we have one organization and some more organizations I'll talk about later. So this is all good, good stuff. We're moving forward in the right kind of direction. Um, there's also an increase in awareness among educators, um, people like yourselves coming along to these things. Um, but extensive reading is not really filtered or penetrated schools, especially high schools. Um, and the intrinsic motivation of, of English uh, learning English is quite low amid uh, a lot of stress and uh, competition. The, there's a lot of uh, uh, extrinsic motivation, a lot of pressure from outside to do well, to get in certain schools or pass certain tests. Lots of pressure are there, but the intrinsic motivation so the, for the love of English for its own sake from my reading is that it's still quite low. And there's several sources of this raising of awareness. First of all, there's changes in publishing in Korea. And my first came to Korea seriously with extensive reading about 10 years ago. There was almost no home grain graded readers, um, whereas most, and nowadays, all the major Korean publishers publishers, um, have or are making a series. They've either imported something or they're making, developing something of their own. Most ER materials were imported and now they have one or two series. Some foreign publishers didn't even bring their readers to display. Um, even five years ago, I think, it, I won't mention the name of the publisher, but I went to their stand, it was a huge, great long stand, and said, could I please see your readers? And they said, sorry, we didn't bring any was now every stand will have these things. I haven't checked today, but my understanding is they're there. There were no guides dedicated to uh, extensive reading and graded reading, um, whereas now Compass have a guide which is available online. We now have a guide here in Korean, published by the Extensive Reading Association and Kira. This is available uh, to give away, and there'll be a PDF online. If everybody wants one later on, please ask. Um, we're happy to let you have. So these are good developments. Um, now we've got many readers' brochures. Um, publishers used to have their readers inside the main catalogue 
whereas now they're starting to produce readers-only catalogs, and that's a good sign. Um, in major bookstores, if you go there, you can find graded readers, but the sort of bottom shelf, out of the way, not really uh, promoted, whereas now some have an ER display. Um, there were, and I believe that many of the publishers and their representatives, when they went to schools and places, they would bring a bag of books, but they wouldn't bring any readers inside those books, whereas now I believe they're bringing them or bringing a brochure. And many sales staff didn't even know what extensive reading was, and sadly, this still continues. And I went around some of the stands this morning talking to one or two people about what these things are. And I, I know the product that they're selling way better than they do. And it's quite clear to me that some of them really don't, don't understand what they're selling. And I spoke to one or two like um, Asia managers, career managers about this. And I said, are you aware that the market that you're trying to aim at is actually here rather than there? They said, I don't care. I just want them to sell them. I'm thinking, whoa, right? That's not really what I learned at school was, you know, you need to market the customer for the right kind of product. And so I still, still think we have a big job here. We still have a big job to try and persuade publishers so they know, know what they're doing. Because they're very much the contact point to promote extensive reading. And if they see it as just something to sell books and help the bottom line, then we've got a bit of a problem. Um, so we need to be aware of that. Another source of, of uh, things are Cotisol Sig, as you know, started 2007 by Scott Miles and Aaron Jolly. Um, I haven't seen Aaron today, but Scott's around. They've got meetings and chapters at annual colloquium, which is on this, on this afternoon from 3.30. Please come along if you have some time. Um, up in the uh, 6201 upstairs uh, in the room here. Uh, it, there's an affiliate of the Extension Reading Foundation and they have their own website. Another one is the Kira, which is a new organization set up, um, started here at Cote in 2010. Um, by a group of people got together, we built a website. It's going to be hosting the Second World Congress on Extensive Reading in September here at Sukmil next year, which is a huge coup for Korean uh, extensive reading. They published a guide, that's this one here I mentioned to you, that's available for you to have a look at, totally free, supported by the, all the publishers, uh, Cambridge, Hindley, uh, Compass, eFuture, Macmillan, Oxford, Pearson, and so on, have all sponsored that, um, and that's very kind of them. There's a the Yahoo discussion group and a Facebook list. So this is another way that people can start to get together. This is mostly in English, and we need something more in Korean. Another source, uh, this is their web page there, which uh, Tim Dolby's been working on recently. I won't let you dwell on that too long, just to say they have a website as well. Um, this is the Congress that they're going to be uh, promoting. Kira's going to be sponsoring um, next September here. Uh, please have a look online. You'll find some information about that. So this is a really good sign and a good focus for all of us to um, focus our efforts on extensive reading here. Um, another source of increase in awareness has been recent research in Korea, and there's several here that I'd just like to mention. Uh, Kwon and Kim, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing the, word, the names correctly, um, found that 12 Korean learners gained in vocabulary after extensive reading and retained most of their gains over time. So that's a good positive sign with Korean learners. Uh, John, in 2008, looked at 17 Korean Air Force subjects who did extensive reading and uh, look, measured their gain in extensive reading for growth in confidence and attitude over controls who didn't do that. And John suggested that formula evaluation of extensive reading was important, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, because I think there's some confusion going on about whether we should or shouldn't evaluate. A chart in 2009 compared to 10 students who did our ER with 10 who didn't. And they showed significant gains in speed, attitude, but not so much in vocabulary. But it reaffirmed that reading at the right level and explicit teaching of vocabulary was still an important part for them. Here's some more. High in 2009 suggests extensive reading strongly be integrated into the curriculum to complement uh, intensive reading and provide the missing massive language input. So again, there's an understanding of massive language input is needed. Yang showed that um, improvements in grammar, vocabulary, and reading come from three groups doing extensive reading with 120 subjects. And uh, O showed that extensive reading was helpful for uh, developing reading skills and can be implemented in formal Korean settings. So these are all good things. 
Um, I don't know if many of you know about this research. Um, please take time to have a look at it. It's all available online if you want to have a look. So these are all good things that's feeding into it, and I like to see more and more of this research and more and more opinion papers coming out in Korean. But the question remains, what actually is extensive reading? And I think in my talks to many people here in Korea and elsewhere, there is some confusion about what extensive reading is. And there are many flavors of it. And unfortunately, um, we get many different ideas and a lot of confusion about what it is. And I just want to kind of clarify things a little bit here. Some people say it's reading at I plus one. Some say I minus one. Some say that reading short texts to discuss. So the idea is you read a short text uh, at a decent level and then you discuss it. That's what extensive reading is. Some people say, no, 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 extensive reading is just pleasure reading. Some people say, no, 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 no. You have to start with simple stories and you work your way up. Somebody else says, no, 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 no. You've got to have reading followed by comprehension questions. Compass Media, for example, have a series of books called Extensive Reading, which is short passages and comprehension questions. Right? So is it extensive reading or not? I don't know. Speed reading, pleasure reading only, reading L1 materials. A lot of people here in Korea believe that if we give L1 materials to students, they are doing extensive reading. Yeah? So there's quite a bit of confusion here and many different varieties of extensive reading. I just want to step through a few of these. It's important that we understand a kind of definition and the flavors of extensive reading because as extensive reading grows, we need to make sure that the people we talk to, the people who we are trying to help bring into the big tent of extensive reading, that they're aware of the various options that are available. And I think the source of many of the problems actually is this. Many of you are familiar with Dame Bamford's 10 Necessary Steps for or Principles of Extensive Reading from their book, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. I think this has caused lots of trouble, to be honest. I like the idea of these 10 steps as an ideal Western type of education system. Variety of uh, materials, easy. Uh, variety of material, learners choose what they do, they read as much as possible. The purpose of reading is related to pleasure, reading its own rewards, speed is usually faster, reading is individual and silent, um, the teachers orient and guide their students, and the teachers are role model of a reader. Now, I don't think anybody can question that in an ideal world. Works for me. Hmm? Works for me. Yes, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. But there's also other things that this doesn't really take into consideration. Let's say, for example, assessment and evaluation. Some people would want an extensive reading program that needs assessment. They need somehow to validate what they're doing to their school, to their students. They feel somehow assessment's important. Or if reading is supposed to be silent and uh, lonely, what happens to buddy reading? Can we have buddy reading in here? That's not part of the Day and Bamford model. Or reading while listening. Listening wasn't even mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes? Follow-up exercises. Many people do that. But according to the Day and Bamford view, there are no follow-up exercises because it's all just for reward. It's not supposed to be part of the classroom. Speed reading focus, um, the amount of time. that Many programs and students are limited by the amount of time that they've got. They don't have free reading pleasure time. They're too busy with clubs or sports or something else. Yeah? Many people have low motivation. Their model assumes relatively high motivation, or at least middle motivation and the necessity to read things you don't want to. They say that students should select the material. That's not always possible. Sometimes the teacher knows better than the student what should be read because the teacher is aware of all the materials. And it's going to take some time for a student to find that home run book, which is the key. They say, wow, this is great. They may have to read 20 or 30 books before they get there. right? So sometimes we have to have the teacher selecting materials. Or there's a course requirement that the whole class read a particular book. Yeah? It's a valid form of extensive reading to do that. And just because you're reading as a class doesn't make it less extensive reading. Also, they said the teacher has to read much. I personally don't read. I haven't read more than one novel this year. Not one. I'm too busy. right? But I know about extensive reading. I read a lot on the web. I read a lot of emails. I read a lot of student work, 
but I don't have time to read a lot. So does that mean that my program is not a good program because I personally don't read that much? Yeah, we have a problem there, right? Similarly, it's very much on sort of a, based on Asian, not based on Asian values and norms. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The teachers often have to select materials. There's often students have a desire to read something difficult. They really, really want to read this book. Under the Day and Bamford thing, no, it should be easy. No, let them have it as far as I'm concerned. So there's a desire for having your performance monitored. Some kids like to know where they're going. They like to see what their progress is. Day and Bamford say, no, that's not what was needed. So the desire to share their reading and extensive reading practice or even do reading circles. So all of these here are valid elements or components or modules of extensive reading programs which people can pick, pick and mix as much as they want to. If you want to take on this sort of um, what we might call a, um, let me just see if it work, a, a unidimensional necessity success view of extensive reading that Day and Bamford have put forward, I certainly see yes, if that works for you, fine. But don't think that that's the only form of extensive reading. I cannot tell you the number of people who've come to me and said, um, actually, Rob, um, I'm not really doing this. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I know it's not pure, real ER on the assumption there is only one way. And I think we have to be, you know, opening up a little bit and making sure that people understand there's a very big tent here that we can bring everybody into for extensive reading. And it doesn't have to be a single model that we work with. There are many ways to do this. There are, however, some clear criteria, what we mean by graded reading or extensive reading, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So if we look here at graded reading and extensive reading, and I think there's a difference here between these two, and I think these get conflated sometimes, and I just want to explore that basically they're the same. With graded reading, extensive reading, reading material at your level, it's comprehensible, you read a lot, you read quickly, it's preferably enjoyable, it's preferably easy, but it doesn't always have to be simplified materials. You can read extensively native materials if you are reading at the right level. Then we can call it extensive reading within the foreign language community. Whereas graded reading assumes that the materials that you've got have been graded in some way. They've been leveled in some way. Extensive reading doesn't necessarily assume that. And I think we can find a distinction between these two things. And we need to accept that many Asian students, sadly, or for uh, many uh, good reasons, are not brought up to be responsible for their learning. They're not really the, sort of the idea of self-directed learning, the, the way of students to uh, take care of themselves, to be independent learners, it's slowly emerging, but still a lot of it is teacher-dependent, teacher-directed materials. And I think we have to be very aware that not all Asians are necessarily brought up to do that. And I've, shown with my, I've seen with my own students where you say, here's a library of books, go and choose. And they just go, oh, don't know where to do. They're not quite sure how to learn by themselves because there have always been decisions that have been made for them by the teachers. Okay? So... We have to assume that if we're going to ask students to do self-directed learning, to be able to choose carefully, be responsible for their learning, that we build that training into the programs that we're doing. We can't just assume they can do so. Okay? And I'm not just talking about Asian students. That also applies to other cultures as well. So the encouragement towards self-directed learning, like this is going to be good for you, it's going to be great, you're going to enjoy it, it's going to be fantastic, go ahead and do it, that sort of encouragement, while it's fine, I have no problem with that, it's often ignored in favour of social, uh, in front of clubs, social life, part-time jobs or whatever. There are other things more important. There was a wonderful piece of research done a few years ago in medicine that looked at the percentage of people who, if they are taking life-saving medicine, that is, if they don't take their medicine, they will die. So you'd naturally expect the intrinsic motivation here 
is for everybody to take their medicine. 70%. 70% of people, knowing they may die if they don't take that medicine, will only take that medicine. What hope do we have for extensive reading when we're competing against clubs and sports and boyfriends and hug ones and, 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 and. So while it's fine to say, yes, go ahead and do it, it's wonderful, it's fantastic, they probably get it. But sorry, there are other things more important. And we have to be careful that our expectations are not so high that we don't get ourselves and them disappointed and end up in some kind of a battle. Similarly, um, students don't start with a home run book. I'm not sure who coined the phrase. Was it Krashen? I think. Yeah, the idea here is that you found a book which you really, ah, now I get reading. Now I really understand. You become so absorbed, so taken by the reading that you forget all the, the fact that you're learning. You're in the flow. You're in the flow of learning. You forget about going to the toilet. You forget about this and you forget about that. And so this home run book is not something that you find easily. Yes, and I think many students still haven't found a home run book in graded reading, in, in extensive reading. So, to me, what I'm saying is, while Dan Bamford say that it should be pleasurable, it should be for its own reward, well, unless we give them an encouragement first and give them a sort of a gentle kick, we're not going to get very far to, for them finding this home run book. And that's why also teacher-selected material is also very important too. If you know a book or books that you think this student would like, a previous student has really, really enjoyed, it's been a home run book for those, that's a good book to put in front of somebody else, rather than just select, just allow them to choose randomly from a thousand titles, where they'll just choose by cover. So we need to make sure we've got this big tent view. Finding an hour of pleasure reading is hard for many students. Now, if I asked you to do exactly the same, as homework for this particular presentation, I'd like you to find an extra hour a week studying Korean, English, French, German. All of you for the next 16 weeks. It's a course requirement. Trying to find an extra hour a week is tough in anybody's life. Yes? And so we have to be very careful here to assume that because it's a good thing to do, people aren't necessarily going to do it. A massive choice can overwhelm. I've seen quite a lot of students who've gone into libraries and just way, way, way too much material. So restricting choice often can be really a, a powerful thing for students. So, you know, while we get this idea of wide variety of material, it can actually cause problems by overwhelming students. So we have to be careful of that balance. And class reading is a valid form of extensive reading. There's no reason, of course, that we can't have a class all reading the same book if the intention is to work through it as a work of literature or a story, or you're doing that to introduce extensive reading, it's a perfectly valid thing to do. And we have to assume that extensive reading is more than just graded readers. There's this kind of belief, um, the sort of default value of the reading material that people use for extensive reading is graded reading materials, graded readers. But that's not always the case. There are other valid forms of, of writing that um, people can, can, uh, can read that are level materials. There's magazines out there, there's blogs, all kinds of websites and things like that. They've got lots of materials, not just graded readers. So we need to be clear then when we're moving forward to this definition of, of extensive reading is, what do I mean by extensive reading? And the key here for me is that students should read. And by that I mean read at the right level. So they should read something quickly and enjoyably with adequate comprehension so they don't need a dictionary. R-E-A-D. Yeah? Now, if students are doing this, we can call it extensive reading. And it doesn't matter whether it's five lines of texts or whether it's 500 lines of text. If they're reading at that level, it's about the process, how they are processing the reading, I think, that's important, not the volume of text necessarily. Of course, the more, the better. But we need to make sure that we can only say they're reading extensively if they're processing text at this level, whether it's graded readers or magazines or web pages or whatever. So if they need a dictionary, of course, it's too hard. They're going to read slowly, get tired and stop and move back to intensive reading. The aim, of course, is fluency and speed, not necessarily learning new language. 
And finally, down here, students uh, read at home out of class. It doesn't have to take a lot of class time. Okay? These are the sort of main components I would think of an extensive reading program. And um, we need to add reading to our existing program, not necessarily replace it. Um, there are relatively few institutions now which do only extensive reading. So our definition should include different things. First is the process of reading at the right level. That's very important to have that as a key element to make sure that students are processing text it's, and uh, they're reading all kinds of different things. And secondly, we've got the pedagogy of extensive reading. That is how we select materials, how we follow up with activities, library management, all of these sort of elements of extensive reading here are kind of components of this, uh, the way we, we frame extensive reading. But I think this is a really key point to mention that it's this, uh, this the way that people process text is really important as a key aspect of extensive reading. So how do they work together, this intensive and extensive reading? Well, if we were to take various scales from low down to high up here, and we were to say 90% here of the vocabulary that students are meeting is known, known vocabulary. That's 10% unknown. If you've got less than 10, less than 90% coverage, we would call that, for example, reading pain. Yes, there's a lot of evidence out there that if you're reading text which has 10% or more unknown language, it's reading pain. It can be demotivating, hard to read, poor comprehension, and hard, a lot of effort, high effort. Okay? So if you then look at, come on, the next level here would be 98%. So if you've got vocabulary there, the level is between 2% unknown to about 10% unknown. We can call this intensive reading or instructional reading. This is the level where you can learn new words in grammar. The idea here is it's a bit too much unknown language for you to actually start reading fluently. Yes? You're stopped all the time with speed reading bumps as you're progressing. So if we've got this sweet Goldilocks spot that's not too hard, not too easy, uh, not so easy becomes uninteresting, that we've got that sweet spot here, we can call that extensive reading where nearly all the words, maybe 1%, 2% of the words are unknown, they can read fast, quickly, adequate comprehension, adequate comprehension, it's enjoyable. That's the sort of level we need to look at. And finally, if you know all the words there, you can practice your speed reading. You, you're not slowed down by any vocabulary, and you can just go quickly and go quickly and go quickly and go quickly as much as you can. High comprehension, natural reading speed, and enjoyable. This is a particular linguistic task. So, this is how I feel these two things probably should, we should fit together. And I think having a clear idea of where one stops and where one starts is important. Because this scale uh, is valid for people who are at an advanced level or beginning level. If you have a beginning level text and more than 10% is unknown, it's reading pain. But for an advanced student, the scale still works. If you're reading Time magazine and more than 10% is unknown, it's reading pain. Of course, if students want to read it, they're really, really keen to read it, let them have it. Not a problem. But we need to be aware that there's this sweet spot here in the middle where we would call extensive reading. So <clears throat> what I've been moving towards here is to try to give you some kind of an idea is that there are various program types, types of programs we could categorize into that would um, help us move forward in, in terms of choosing and promoting and pushing extensive reading. So those of you who leave here, go to your colleagues, and you recognize the kind of needs that they have, and they want to, you want them to pick and mix from all the various options to do with extensive reading, um, then you can choose uh, or select or suggest a certain type of extensive reading program for them, rather than say, there's only one type and you have to do it this way. Come on, here we go. The purist program is the one a little bit like Dane Bamford have said. You know, lots of self-selective reading at home with little or no assessment or follow-up often um, is a standalone class of extensive reading, yes. That's the sort of crashonite, if you will, uh, purist view. And there's nothing wrong with this. Nothing at all wrong with doing this. 
It's a perfectly valid, very good form. We might even assume that it's the aim, the goal to move towards. But that's not where everybody is and not where every program is. So we would have another program which we might call an integrated program, which I think is where most of us would be, where you've got the self-selective eating at home and in class, but there's exercises or reports, or maybe there's an integrated course, maybe there's a four skills course book that goes with it. So they're integrated together. They fit together. And that's, again, a valid, probably the most standard form of extensive reading. The next form would be where the class reading. Again, it's a kind of study class rather than a practice reading class, where students read the same book and they work through it slowly. Lots of follow-up comprehension work and exercises. So they're all reading the same text. Sometimes, unfortunately, this is only like two or three texts a semester, which we can question whether that's extensive or not, in the sense of volume. But anyway, it's a valid form here. And the last one is where students would do e extensive reading as a form of literature, where they would probably choose a classic work of literature, maybe you know, Jane Eyre or maybe a Charles Dickens story, uh, the graded reader version, and work through it um, as, a, uh, as a work of literature. So you stop every chapter and you discuss what the author's doing, what happened in the background, critique these things, look at the ideas, maybe look at some of the literary techniques in the book. So all of these here are valid extensive reading programs, provided they meet the conditions of extensive reading, which is R-E-A-D. If the students are reading something which is too heavily study, then we can't really call it extensive reading. It's probably more an intensive program. So here's a summary of what they might be. Down the left, we've got the style, the amount of reading, the speed, control, and so on. This is a kind of summary table, and rather than walk through it, I'll let your eye cast over that for a minute or two. So if you're promoting extensive reading here in Korea, and you need to be aware that there are various program types. And as we move forward into the next decades of extensive reading here in Korea, having these options available to you to suggest and options for the teachers to say, oh, thank goodness I don't have to do it in the way that uh, is a purist form. I can do it in a different way. will allow more schools and more options and more programs to bring it in rather than feel, I'm sorry, I can't do the pure one, therefore I don't want to do it. So, as a summary here of that, there are many different types of program, um, all with different aims and different levels of involvement for teachers and students. Some of them are very hands-off. Here's a library, go and read books. Other ones are very hands-on, where the teacher's walking th students through these programs, lots and lots of advice, lots of follow-up activities, and so on and so on. And programs may have two or three different types. So you may have your oral communication classes, for example, doing some supplemental reading. You may find in your uh, study of literature class that they're doing a classic work of literature using the graded reader version in the same language program. Some programs are very easy to start. You can start with a bag of books. Just go off and read, choose a book, read it, take it home. Or they'll be much more complex, much more involved. And uh, each of these types is scalable from a single class to a whole school. Um, and that's important that when you're designing and planning these things and suggesting it, that you help students and teachers understand how these things can be scalable to a much larger level than where they are now. But there's no best type. There's no correct type. There's no right type of extensive reading. There are many different forms, all based around the idea of fast, fluent, comprehensible, enjoyable text without a dictionary. Then it's extensive reading. So, as we move forward, <clears throat> I've noticed in my work um, promoting extensive reading in Korea and also in Japan, Thailand, China, and various other places, that there seem to be various stages of adoption. All the way down to no knowledge, there's initial resistance to extensive reading for various reasons, early adopters, initial acceptance, acceptance, and finally integration. So here we've got, I just don't know it. I've never heard of it. Don't know anything about it. Yes? They've heard of it, but they resist it, claiming various reasons. Oh, I can't do it because of my curriculum. I can't do it because of time. Don't have the resources, and so on and so on. 
Then we have some early adopters, people who lead the way, the sort of Rockies of the world, who have a program push. They start to tell other people about it. And this is kind of where we are now in Korea. We've got quite a few early adopters. People are coming along. They're starting to get interested in extensive reading. They're starting to read about it, getting a few books, trying it out for themselves. But still, the vast majority of people in your institution probably don't do this or don't believe in it or don't really understand it. And outside your institution, you can probably find 5, 10, 15 institutions who have no intention of doing this, at least now. But what we're finding now is that the next stage down is where most people know about extensive reading. Maybe they're not doing it, but they might just start to feel guilty. I know I should be doing it, I know the reasons for it, but I'm not doing it and I feel bad about it. And that's a good step, it's a healthy step further forward. And finally, most programs are doing it. And at the end, it's actually built into a curriculum, a national or a state or a school curriculum that, is, that extensive reading is part of um, the program. And I think we're sort of about here. Yeah, there are a lot of people still here, and we're kind of moving down here. And I still think there's a lot of work, a lot of room for improvement in, in Korea for, for the future. So we need to meet the teachers and students where they are. We need to lessen their fear of change and newness. There's a natural resistance amongst many people to want to, uh, to, to not do something new. They're not sure how to do these things. And as we saw, uh, as we'll see in a minute, actually, um, people's perceptions can change quite quickly. So there's several different ways to promote peer experience, mathematical reasons, emotional reasons, and so on. Let's look at each one of these. This is a study by um, Byun doctoral program. Um, he interviewed 100 Korean school teachers on their participation in an ER program. He asked 100 teachers, here's some great readers, go and read it. What's it like as an experience for you as a teacher? And <coughs> Byung found several things. That attitude changed after initial skepticism. Most like, no, 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 no. But the majority of people, once they'd done it, realized it was a very beneficial thing and can see the benefits for their students. Um, they recommended gradual introduction of the program rather than something sort of like, bang, there you go. Nice and slow, test the waters, see what works and see what doesn't work. The main problems for implementing extensive reading are the standard excuses of, oh, we need to evaluate the students, motivate them. We need, the students are not motivated. We've got reluctant and struggling students. And the teacher's conflicting role in the extensive reading class. Many teachers believe that my role as a teacher is to teach. And if I'm not teaching, I'm just watching my students read, what am I doing here? Yes. So many people have this sort of belief system, strong belief system that says, I am a teacher, therefore I teach. Rather than, I would feel a, a, a better approach would be to say, my job is to help students learn. And sometimes that means I shut up and say nothing and let them get on with it. Yeah? So... This is a problem with a conflicting role in terms of teacher belief systems. And the teachers did not display, interestingly, didn't display foreign language anxiety. They weren't anxious about reading in a foreign language and felt that even after the program, it wasn't a difficult thing to do this extensive reading. So this kind of peer knowledge here is something you can pass on to other people. Other Korean teachers, standard, ordinary, everyday Korean school teachers have done this. They found it a good experience. If you're promoting extensive reading, people say, oh, I can never do this, point them at Bjorn's research. Or you could do the mathematical reasons. You could say learners need eight or 9,000 words to read texts at native level, or about 2,000 words at an intermediate level. It takes 20 or 30 meetings of a word to learn it receptively, which means that you're going to need millions and millions of words of texts in order to, to, to learn a language. So that's the mathematical reason. Unless they meet lots of texts, they're not going to meet words enough for them to stay in their head. Another way is emotional. Come on. Okay. You could say things like reading makes you smarter. It's, you learn about the human condition. Um, reading is enjoyable. It can enrich your life. All of these are emotional reasons. You know, it's good language practice. The only realistic skill you've got you know, allows them to read all kinds of things. This is another way that some teachers will respond to. Some teachers will respond to data. Some teachers will respond to emotional arguments or maybe even um, a logical argument. 
Course books can only introduce language elements. They can't introduce everything. Um, the course books can't teach everything. There's too much to learn and do. Therefore, you need to have... And vocab, se vocab selection in courses tends to be topical and not semantically related. Uh, and therefore, uh, course books are linear in design and can't do everything. There's a logical reason here to say course books cannot, by their design, do everything that they need to do. Because they have a linear nature going from unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four, and so on. Because of this linear nature, it needs supplementary extra reading to deepen that knowledge. And um, as course books repeat the average word only two or three times, including Korean course books, it's not a very good thing to do. And they can't teach all the collocations and patterns. Therefore, extensive reading can bring this that the course book doesn't do. Okay? Or we've got some more data here. Data from Furukawa, 2009. Two years of extensive reading gives second grade junior, this is in Japan, second grade junior high school level students an equivalent reading level to third grade senior high. They jump three years in school in English, having done an extensive reading program. And research here by Moggy showed that from the viewpoint of neuroscience, the best way to make progress in learning English is to read as many English sentences as possible. And Moggy also has some data to support that. Or you can show how extensive reading fits the program by saying that um, course books and graded readers are two sides of the same program, um, same coin, they help each other. Course books introduce language, greater readers help design, deepen and strengthen the knowledge, and so on. And it should be integrated into our courses, and it shouldn't be an option. Course books should be uh, at the right level for your students, so they can read, uh, they should choose books at the right level for your students, so that they can read uh, comfortably and understand without uh, a dictionary. Come on. Okay, um, but what you typically hear from many people are some objections. I like this, you're right, but, but. And when you hear these things as we move forward with extensive reading, these are some of the things that you can say. Typical objection is that the books are too easy and childish, um, they're not learning anything. Easy is good so they can build reading speed. Choose books at the student's fluent reading level. We talked about that sweet spot for extensive reading practice. Another complaint, is, and also native materials are too hard, often demotivating for many students who simply cannot cope with it. And intermediate students can't read intermediate level graded readers. This is important to understand. If a student is an intermediate level learner, doesn't mean they can read intermediate level texts. Because there's a difference between knowing about language and understanding language, slowly decoding a text, very different from the fluent reading, fast reading of texts. Okay? Intermediate students typically would read elementary level texts. And um, I talked before about the ideas, I'm not teaching, therefore they're not learning. I need to teach, sorry, it's no good for me. I need to be teaching them new stuff. And the objection to this is, come on, our job is not to teach, but to help people to learn, okay? To build uh, independence, reading speed, and fluency. Other objections are, come on, boy. I think I'm running out of battery here. Dealing with objections too. It's a nice idea, I have no time in my course. My response is, if they don't do this graded reading, extensive reading, where are they going to get this massive language practice? We know they need it, so fine, opt out, but then the students pay the price. How are they going to get a sense of language that they would need to build? Or we don't have money. My experience is that I've never found a, a program yet that doesn't have money somewhere, somehow. There's always money somewhere. You may need to look in places you don't usually look, but there's always money somewhere. You can get reallocate the funds, or get the reading done, get free samples, donations, um, reading marathons, all kinds of things. Or another big classic one, we have to go through our set curriculum, speak with the course designers to building graded reading. And uh, the big one, 
I have to prepare students for test. There's a lot of research now that shows if you compare students who are doing extensive reading with students who are doing exam preparation, students who are doing the exam preparation score worse over the same period of time than students who do extensive reading. Why is this? Because when you're building language for tests, it's all discrete, single point knowledge, whereas extensive reading is consolidating, pulling the knowledge together, the grammar, the vocabulary, they can see how it works together. There's a lot of evidence that extensive reading will help students improve on their test scores better than test prep classes. Um, I don't know how much time I've got. Two, three minutes? Five minutes. Okay, let's whiz through this. Why do they fail? Well, one of the main reasons that they fail, it's optional. Yes, and if you, uh, people approach you about uh, developing an extensive reading program here in Korea, I would suggest that you say, this is not optional, it's required reading. Um, come on, boy. Um, if, they, if it is optional, students will opt out. Yes, they will, they do, consistently. The mess and the, mess the important thing here is, um, I'd like you to do the reading if you have time, meaning I don't think it's important enough for you to do so, and therefore, it's easy for them to escape. And our job is to help them learn. So we need to make sure that they require them to do this. Only after requiring them to do the reading can they find that home run book. That then will lead to a, sort of a more intrinsic motivation for a love of reading. And also means that the administrators don't see it as valuable and therefore when it comes to budget cuts, they'll cut out the extensive reading program. So if it's optional, it can be cut. If it's required, it can't be cut. Come on, come on, come on. And it should be required. So, so the teachers value the learning. <coughs> it's part of the course book and tell them they're going to be graded on it. Students see this as natural and normal part of language learning, not as an extension, a supplement. No, this is part of the program. We continue doing our normal courses, our normal textbook, our listening, our reading, our writing, and we add extensive reading into it. Come on. And another reason is curriculum changes. So there's changes to a, to a test taking. We need to take tests, um, move away from speaking, or we move to speaking or some other focus. Or the extensive reading enthusiast leaves the school and therefore the program dies because there's nobody going to carry it on. It becomes one person's baby. All the materials are inappropriate. This is a huge problem. Many people buy the wrong materials. They tried them out, oh, my students couldn't learn from them, and therefore, extensive reading was no good, we tried it. Sorry, yes? Inappropriate materials um, is very important. Make sure they get the right material, so test it out with some students. Starting badly. I've seen many programs try and start too fast, too quickly, and as you saw from Byun's research, the recommendation is start gradually with one or two classes, a few students. Learn what works, learn what doesn't work for your students in your situation and help other people understand. So when promoting or adopting the system, work within the system and don't expect miracles. As we develop extensive reading, as you promote it, as you move forward uh, with uh, extensive reading here in Korea, don't expect everything to go perfectly. Their situation and condition may be quite different from yours. So try and understand where they're coming from. What do they need? What can they do? If they can only do one book a semester, that's fine. It's better than nothing. And um, you need to learn what's at stake for them. You wouldn't want to put a teacher in a position where they start an extensive reading program, they get lots of money from the school, but don't get support from the school so the program fails. That's then embarrassing for the teacher. You don't want to embarrass teachers, putting them in a situation where they take too much of a risk. And I've seen this happen several times as well. So make sure you know where they are. And if they mistake the meaning of extensive reading, remember, we have a big tent view of extensive reading. Make sure then that uh, if they don't know the meaning of extensive reading, then you can use graded reading. Now, I believe in Korean, it's tadoku, is, is uh, for extensive reading. But another way to do the same thing is uh, to call it, um, is my thing, go away, is to call it uh, dokso, which I believe is just read. Yes? So if, you, if you're having problems with people understanding tadoku, and they think they know what it means, but what they think is, Extensive reading is not what you think and what you know is extensive reading. Change the name. Okay, you know about Toroko. Have you heard about Dokso? Right? And explain them in a different way. So rebrand it. 
yeah, is an effective way. In Japanese, they have the same thing called rakudoku, which means easy reading, not just ta, which is the same word, tadoku, in Japanese. Okay, I'll leave it there. We do have a couple more slides, but I think we're up for time. Um, this, this presentation is available at my website, and I'm just going to skip through to the end. Um, if you go right to the very end of the... Come on. I think it's two or three more slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. It's... Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me get out of here. So you can see, if you want this presentation, it's there and is available. I want to spend 30 seconds with you. We've just started a new website called Extensive Reading Central. Um, ER is very fragmented. We have many websites doing many things. So ER Central... Um, is a new website where we're going to pull lots of information together. And uh, please think about uh, um, uh, looking at the er-central.com. It's a new website for extensive reading, which we've been building. Thank you for your time.